We showed that episode of Remington Steel in place of Match of the Day, which we regret we were unable to bring you because of an industrial dispute. There's a thriller just beginning on BBC Two now. It's from the series Film International and stars Catherine Deneuve in Écoute Voir. And if you want to be really scared, don't miss the late night horror film in 40 minutes here on BBC One. It's The Shuttered Room. Now, another generous helping of Carrots Lib. It's always an odd number, isn't that strange? <laughs> How many of you are heterosexual? <laughs> It's going to be a good show, this. <laughs> Hello. Ah, th thank you for joining us. Um, we're a bit behind schedule this week, because we've all been in the boozer. Uh, no normally, before you join us, we, we sort of survey the audience to find out what they like and, and to see whether uh, they're here. <laughs> so, excuse me while I just finish off, OK? Um, all those people that do aerobics, hands up. And down. <laughs> and, and rest. There we are. OK. Uh, which of these numbers do you find funny? Uh, one. Uh, 17. Uh, 69. Three and a half million. I see, I see, eh? Don't give a stuff about the unemployed, eh? You just want to bury your head. <laughs> In the sun! <laughs> OK, OK. Hey, how many people in the audience have been sponsored by the sun? <laughs> I know you can't put your hands up because of the jacket. <laughs> just grunt. Good, OK. Right. I was trying to, trying to remember what life was about before sponsorship. I know me aerial yet. And, uh, <laughs> it's, it's, it's here somewhere, that's it. So many things sponsored and so many, so many sponsorships that are in Congress. I mean, this week, Benson and Hedges have sponsored the Indoor Tennis Championships at Wembley. What's tennis got to do with lung cancer? <laughs> I mean, why don't Benson and Hedges sponsor funerals? <laughs> then you can get buried in the new flip-top box. <laughs> in fact, why, why don't all the cigarette manufacturers club together and sponsor the health service? Much more sense, any you? you know, just 2,000 embassy coupons and you can have a surgical swab left in your stomach. <laughs> Sport seems to get more than its fair share of sponsorship. Horse jumping in particular, you know, with those ridiculous sponsored names of horses. And coming up to the first fence, it's Sanyo Audio Laser 250, Quadraphonic Center, 25% off now at Boots and other leading stores. Written by Captain Mark Phillips, portable TV and tape recorder. <laughs> and that was a clear round. Another sport where you can't see the participants for the sponsor's label is motor racing. Not only do cigarette companies like sponsoring, but so do those surgical rubber companies. <laughs> And the John Player special always seems to come in behind the Durex-sponsored car. <laughs> well, it's for the people that prefer the cigarette afterwards. <laughs> very good, very good. Football sponsorship is surely getting out of hand. I mean, our traditions are going out of the window. I mean, it's now the Cannon Football League and the Milk Cup. <laughs> Soon it'll be the Blamange Charity Shield. <laughs> or Roundtree sponsoring the cup final with the Sweet FA Cup. <laughs> <laughs> we can live, we, we can live, yes, we can also watch. Uh, <laughs> we can. <laughs> sort of running the mouth in for a donkey, you're all right. <laughs> you can watch live league football. Now, and, and have you sussed how often the trainer comes on with a tin of aerosol paint to repair the advert on the front of the shirt? <laughs> hey? And in last Sunday's live game at Liverpool, I noticed Everton's defensive wall took some time to assemble because the numerals on the players' backs had to correspond with the advertiser's phone number. <laughs> the word sponsorship gives the impression that 
someone's actually giving something. For instance, when you see the NatWest trophy, you think, good old NatWest, eh? Must be keen on cricket. Great. And then you think about it. And it should really be called the people with a NatWest overdraft trophy. <laughs> They're the ones who are paying for it. <laughs> then, then there's the London Marathon. That's going to be sponsored by a chocolate bar. Not, not the Marathon chocolate bar, you know, the, the bar with more peanuts in every slice because it's cheaper than chocolate. <laughs> <laughs> no, it, it's, it's the other bar that contains glucose for energy, sugar for stamina and chocolate to make you throw up after a mile and a half. <laughs> Talking of throwing up, I see it's the Miss World contest on Wednesday. <laughs> sponsored by Mecca. I reckon it should be sponsored by Dewhurst. <laughs> That's more appropriate. I wonder if... I wonder if Andre Prebin will be watching the finals on his colour TV set. <laughs> have, you, have you seen Andre do that advert for Ferguson? I mean, it's only surpassed by Ted Malt and that fan that blows up the front of his house. <laughs> Andre Previn stands in front of a TV set and says, look at the fantastic colour on this set. And you go, yeah, fabulous. <laughs> but hang on. If his colour looks that fantastic on my TV set, <laughs> why do I need a Ferguson? <laughs> Think about this in bed, you know. <laughs> personally, I d personally, I don't do advertising. I mean, anyone asks me to sponsor their product, I just tell them to get Paxode. <laughs> <laughs> not bad, not bad. I couldn't let this week go by without, without passing comment on the latest vogue in relationships. That of the older woman uh, taking younger lovers. You know, Britt Eklund, Joan Collins has discovered the secret of eternal youth. She keeps changing him for a new one. <laughs> on, on television, we have Penelope Keith having it off with a man who was young enough to know better. <laughs> and in a movie called Class, Jacqueline Bissett plays the older woman who falls for her son's best friend. And there's a scene where he calls around and knocks on his mate's door and says, Can your mom come out to play? <laughs> I've missed the boat again, haven't I? I mean, when I was a teenager, no one's mum made advances towards me. <laughs> the most erotic thing on offer was a, a trip to the bathroom to have Clearasil smeared over your zip. <laughs> Mind you, if they had made an approach, I would have been oh, just too naive to realise it. I mean, I was woefully ignorant. I mean, I used to think a one-to-one -one relationship was something you had at 12.59. <laughs> that monogamy was a board game <laughs> and the pill, what a jerk I was. I used it myself for six months. <laughs> and I found out you had to take it orally. <laughs> How you bung it down your ear is beyond me, I tell you. Fed up with the rat race? Want to get away from it all? Then start a new life in a new town. London. Yes, London New Town has everything. Only corner shops. Modest parish churches. And appealing monuments. Some still awaiting completion. It's also got plenty of quiet corners away from the noise of modern technology. And what other area can offer you such friendly neighbourhood street passes? <laughs> and if you still don't believe us, just listen to this. In a recent poll, London was unanimously voted for as a better place to live. By the population of Milton Keynes. <laughs> Uh, 
Uh, if you're living in Milton Keynes, there's one or two news items you may have missed. Uh, Les Dawson had a line censored from his spot at the Royal Variety Show. He told the audience, as you've had to take a mortgage out to pay for the seats, I'm not going to bugger about. <laughs> Come on, Les, I mean, you know better than to say mortgage in front of the royal family. <laughs> A man who went to pick up a new British passport today decided against it when he was told that they've now gone up to 15 pounds. Screw that, he said. I'll wait for the paperback to come out. <laughs> AstroTurf have just tendered a million pound bid to resurface Jimmy Hill's chin. <laughs> and the Daily Mail were accused this week of helping fascists. It's not like the mail to lean that far to the left, is it? <laughs> <laughs> and finally, the Japanese have asked President Reagan not to place nuclear weapons in Japan, because the last one they placed went off. <laughs> okay. Meanwhile, in Moscow... Welcome to Moscow, Doctor. It's good of you to come all the way from Omsk to look at Comrade Andropov. Please, Doctor, it's my pleasure. Anything I can do to help. How is the Premier? He's got the worst cold I've ever seen. <laughs> he hasn't moved in ten weeks. Hmm. Sounds serious. Have you tried Lemsip? <laughs> Lemsip, night nurse, nothing works. How's his system? Well, he's a little constipated. Mm. When was the last time he moved his bowels? Spring. <laughs> Spring? Now, let's face it, he's not regular. Not regular? He's about as regular as Halley's Comet. Mm, maybe we've made the wrong diagnosis, Doctor. After all, the Westerners say we spend more on defense than on medical research. Nonsense, comrade. We have the best surgeons, the finest, most up-to-date medical treatments in the world. Uh, excuse me, it's almost time to change his leeches. <laughs> leeches? Don't you use wasps in a jar? Hey, comrade, you're not in Omsk now. This is Moscow. Hey, you'll have to get used to our modern technology. Get a load of this. By the beard of Lenin, what's that? This, we call it a thermometer. <laughs> we use it to take the patient's temperature. A thermometer? How did you get it so compact? Hey. <laughs> it's the handy portable model. Well, the others, they're so bulky. Oh. Hey. hey! Not bad for a cold morning. Hey, no kidding! What the Western surgeons wouldn't give to have this little baby. What's the reading? Hey, give it time. Uh, all this modern technology, we surgeons could soon be obsolete. Yes. I'm getting a reading. What's his temperature? 9,000 degrees centigrade. <laughs> That's hot. Yes, even allowing for our 80% error margin. He's still four times hotter than the Earth's core. Is that normal? No, I think he must be running a fever. Comrade, do you think perhaps the machine could be faulty? Comrade, what do you mean? Let me see his chart. There you are. Hmm. Blood pressure, 3 million over 10. Heart rate, 76 a day. Respiration, <laughs> respiration one. See, nothing wrong with the machines. Uh, but according to these figures, he's a supernova with the circulatory system of a lizard. Yes, yeah, sure. Yeah, but what do we tell the press? We say he's got a cold. <laughs> Pate brings you the news from around the world. Top gourmet Egon Rone complains about the standard of British Airways food. Here, airline chefs demonstrate it only comes from the very freshest natural products. <laughs> Although they reject the new Sunreader bottle opener. <laughs> Politics. And Sir Geoffrey Howe, the most competent man in the Foreign Office, takes time off to play golf. <laughs> the 
new police bill. And the constable exercises his new right to stop and search at random. <laughs> London and tenants in Islington complain about the high level of damp in council houses. <laughs> the media and breakfast time astrologer Russell Grant releases a new aerobics album, Keep Fat and Dense. <laughs> On the medical front, doctors discover herpes 3. This particular strain of the virus attacks the clothing. <laughs> Sport and Leeds United players train for their milk cup tie against Oxford United. <laughs> While boxing manager Terry Lawless stages a fight off to select Frank Bruno's next opponent. <laughs> and finally, John Lloyd and the British tennis team at last find a way of putting their tennis rackets to good use. <laughs> And that's the weekend focus with chicken cutting. <laughs> Welcome to the Mecca Ballroom for the final of the Mist World Domination Contest. And without further ado, let's meet the first contestant, Miss USA. Cindy Winkler! Hello, Cindy. Hi there, big boy. And what are your statistics? Well, they're 1 in 10 unemployment, 5% inflation, and the biggest defense budget in the world. Oh, yeah. Now, this is the part where we like to get to know you a little better. It says here you like traveling. I sure do. Have you been anywhere exotic? Oh, yes. I was in Middle East and the Caribbean, and I'm just about to drop in on your little old Greenham Common. Oh, that's <laughs> terrific. Very nice. Now, what sort of hobbies do you have? Oh, uh, telling lies and kicking the crap out of commie bedwetters. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. And finally, here's just a quick intelligence test. What does 10 Cubans and three Soviet advisors make? Uh, a communist threat? That's really good. <laughs> Thank you, Cindy. And now let's meet the next contestant, Miss Soviet Union, Olga Maitlansky. <laughs> Hello, Olga. Hello, big boy. <laughs> and what are your statistics? That's state secret. I see. Do you, do you have any hobbies? Marching through other people's countries. <laughs> and freelance threatening. Very good. And, and what will you do if you win the competition? Paint the town red. <laughs> Every town. Ah, that, that's wonderful, wonderful. So we've seen Miss USA and Miss Soviet Union, so let's meet our other contestants. Miss Lebanon. That's me, honey. <laughs> Miss Afghanistan. That's me. <laughs> Miss El Salvador. Me again, honey. <laughs> Miss Czechoslovakia. Me. <laughs> Miss Germany. That's me. me. No, that's hey, me. Hey, that's me. That is You're me. Kevin. Tell you a story from way back. Try to come down and dig me, Jack. There's Big Mo, Little Mo, Four Eyed Mo, No Mo. Look at brother, look at brother, look at brother, look at brother, Emo. Who's the greatest band around? Made the cats jump up and down. Who's the talk of Rhythm Town? Five guys named Mo. When they start to beat it out, everybody jump and shout. Tell me who do those critics rave about? Five guys named Mo. They came out of nowhere, but that don't mean a thing. That's right. They rate high, you'll know why, when you hear them swing. High brow, low brow, we all agree. They're the tops in harmony. I'm telling you folks, you really ought to see. Five guys named Mo.
of nowhere, but that don't mean a thing. That's right. They rate high, you'll know why, when you hear them swing. High brow, low brow, we all agree. They're the best in harmony. I'm telling you folks, you really ought to see. Five guys they mo. Thank you. That was the Chevalier Brothers, doing very well since Morris left. <laughs> <laughs> Who writes these leads? <laughs> the, uh, one of the biggest news items in the week uh, <clears throat> was the, the way the common market have been trying to nick our money back. <coughs> Typical, isn't it? Eh? You, know, you know why the other nine countries are doing this? Because they can't stand being foreign. <laughs> <laughs> It really bugs them that we're British and they're foreign. <laughs> Particularly the French. <laughs> hey, it's the French that niggle me. I mean, it was the French who wouldn't let us into the common market. For years, France wouldn't let us in. It was de Gaulle, wasn't it? No. <laughs> no. Do you remember de Gaulle? Six foot six, big conk. <laughs> How the jackal missed that is beyond me. <laughs> They can't get enough of us now, though, can they, eh? Flogging us all that junk. <laughs> do, you know, do you know, in the last election, up in the north, there was a very obscure political party called the Invade and Conquer France Party. <laughs> Who I joined that, eh? Ooh, no problem. <laughs> the main aim is to stop that insidious French influence creeping into our everyday lives. And it's only ten francs to join, so... <laughs> <laughs> Kill bargain! <laughs> Mind you, it, it is a very obscure political part. I mean, it's so obscure, Channel 4 are making a peak-time documentary on it. <laughs> but do you ever stop to think of the rubbish we buy from France? They must regard us as the biggest mug jobs in Europe. I mean, I was always a bit suspicious why they let us in in the first place. And I, I did some checking, right? And this is right. You go and check this. The year that France let us into the common market was the year that France had an immense milk yield. The year France let us into the common market, all the French cows went bonkers. <laughs> they started producing milk morning, noon and night. So much so that, after a while, all over France were these great big festering curds. <laughs> <laughs> no curds, that's what I'm <laughs> Mon Dieu, they all cried, you know, what are we going to do about this lot? <laughs> And then one bright froggy, who just returned from this country and realised someone was making a fortune selling recycled hush puppies and calling it Kentucky Fried Chicken... <laughs> ..says, hang on a minute, I've got an idea. The Brits will eat this lot. He said, you what? He said, yeah, what we do is we make it into great big lumps of smelly cheese and the Brits will eat it. Vous <laughs> parlez through your dead ears, yeah. <laughs> No, I'm not. He said, we've got to be a bit clever about it. He said, you know, when we've made it, we've got to call it something typically French, because the Brits like tray chic, you know. <laughs> call it something like brie or camembert, camembert, that's a good one. We'll call it camembert. And we'll charge a fortune for it, because they're all snobs. <laughs> and we'll sell it exclusively through Harrods and Fortnum and Masons. And that's what they did. And we bought the lot. <laughs> We're still buying it. Tesco sell camembert now. <laughs> Everybody's buying camembert. I'm buying camembert. <laughs> I hang it on a pole in the garden. It keeps the flies out the house. <laughs> <laughs> so, with the success of that, naturally, they thought, blimey, what else can we flog to the Brits? They said, whoa, we've, we've got a few million cubic tonnes of cow dung. <laughs> oh, they'll never eat that. <laughs> And, and we've got those millions of Marks and Spencer bags left over from the missus's shopping trips to Dover. <laughs> right, this is what we'll do. We'll cut the bags up into little pieces of paper, we'll roll them round a couple of ounces of cow dung, and we'll call them Gulwar. <laughs> <laughs> and we buy millions of them. 
It's all the blokes trying to look macho, isn't it? Hi there. <laughs> I'm smoking cow dung. <laughs> Gauloise is a luxury. I mean, all the other French fags are made from pure, unadulterated pig shit. <laughs> so if you're Jewish, check with your rabbi. <laughs> The list is endless. There's, there's those Citroen cars with the, with the back suspension that lift ten foot into the air. That's so they can avoid the French drunks in the gutter. <laughs> Have you ever drank Van de Tabla? Eh? Sarsons, we call it. <laughs> and you get them French golden delicious apples. <laughs> Water bags, that's what they are. <laughs> you ever had one? Oh, 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 oh. <laughs> <laughs> we buy all this junk. And, and what do the French take off us? Petula Clark. <laughs> yeah, well, fair is fair, I suppose. <laughs> <laughs> Dreading the arrival of the Channel Tunnel. I mean, there'll be no stopping them then, will it? Eh? Millions of kamikaze French drivers, you know, with their Renault 5s packed to the gunnels with peri water bouncing off the walls of the tunnel. And getting lost, you know, and turning up on the Bakerloo line. <laughs> and when they build the tunnel, there's going to be millions upon millions of Earth. And where's it all going to go to? Oh, sure, the French, the French will have half of it. But you wait, eh? They'll be, they'll be there sneaking back here, you know, climbing off the bikes, trousers full of earth, <laughs> doing a cold it's job, you know. <laughs> I mean, I try to avoid, you know, racial stereotypes, but, I mean, it is a fact the French do wear striped jerseys and berets and ride on bikes with onions around them, don't they? <laughs> why? Well, I know why they wear striped jerseys. Because they've only got to put the mask on and they're ready for work. <laughs> That's why they invented the French kiss. That's right. To distract you with the tongue while they pick your pocket. <laughs> That's a, that's a bit over the top. I'm sorry. <laughs> I, am, I, am, I do apologise. If there's any French people watching, you know, remember Agincourt! <laughs> And now, the debut on BBC television of that popular comedy series set in the forthcoming nuclear age, Ash. <laughs> Through early morning fog I see Visions of the things to be The things Attention all personnel Report to the casualty unit immediately and stand by for incoming wounded suffering from radiation sickness. Have a nice day. <laughs> Come on, Charles. Duty calls. If you don't mind, Pierce, I'm trying to listen to a little music. Music? That's funny. All I can hear is Richard Clayderman. <laughs> Pierce, if we have to share this nuclear shelter for much longer, you and I are gonna fall out. <laughs> Charles, will you stop doing enemy lines? Pierce, they've got 36 cases of radiation sickness out there. And I got 36 cases of dry martini in here. How about a little snort, huh? Hawkeye! Talking of a little snort, here's one now. Hawkeye, you thieving schmuck. What have you done with my gas mask? You mean you're not wearing it? Oh, very funny. <laughs> we'll be such a smart ass when we all start mutating. I know, I'll be laughing on the other side of my foot. <laughs> Holy holocaust, what's holding you guys up? Well, Margaret's holding me up and the Major has no visible means of support. <laughs> Colonel Potter, I appeal to you. Wrong. You most certainly do not. This is Major, Major. With all this fallout, I'm suddenly seeing the wounded in a new light. Fluorescent. Confucius, he say, don't worry, they soon glow on you. Colonel Potter, have you seen my gas mask? And no remarks from you, Pierce. Fear not, Margaret, my apocalypse is sealed. Hi, everybody. I just popped over to say, fun farewell. My flinger, a corporal in search of his privates. I finally made it. I'm taking the next flight home. All these years, Klinger, you spent posing as a woman to no avail. How did you swing it? Well, actually... Okay. Okay. I finally became a woman, thanks to mutation. Gentlemen, I give you a toast to Klinger, the only GI to go abroad 
and come back abroad. People of the world, good evening. I, Ronnie Reagan, have decided to speak to you to clear up a few misunderstandings that seem to have arisen in the press this morning. <laughs> when I said that Cuba was an island in the Mediterranean, <laughs> I did, of course, mean Japan. <laughs> Cuba is an island in Japan. Next, I'd like to answer allegations made by some irresponsible commentators that I'm a madman with bizarre delusions. Such commentators are a dangerous breed of spotted fish, <laughs> whom in the fullness of time I intend to eat, deep fried with a wedge of lemon. Also, I should like to make it absolutely clear that the United States has no territorial interest whatsoever in the next galaxy. <laughs> With the exception, of course, of the planet Spog, <laughs> on which Nancy and I would like to build a holiday home. <laughs> God bless America. God bless the world. God bless you. God bless me. God bless the little green man who lives up my tree. Good night. <laughs> How's that? There's no washing powder, me trees gentle and soft to the touch. Then have a look at this. A simple test proves the difference. We washed one shirt in a well-known brand of non-biological powder, and another shirt in new system, biological, scab automatic. If you want to see the difference, have a look at this. You see, it really works. So next wash day, why not do something rash? Pick scab and bring your clothes up to scratch. Send him in. Thank you, lovey. Go straight through, shall I? Lovely. <laughs> it's nice to see you again, Damien. A B.A., can I be completely frank, lovey? By all means. Well, honestly, my darling, you're just not getting me the work. Now, that's not fair, Damien. I've got you dozens of jobs, but you keep turning them down. Naturally, lovey. The only parts you ever offer me are those bloody tea adverts. <laughs> not something more challenging, my Like lovey. what? Theatre, lovey. <laughs> Theatre. Macbeth! Damien, we've discussed this. No one will hire you to play Macbeth. 
No, why not? Because, because you're too hairy. Hamlet's out because you're too bandy. And you can't play a romantic lead like Romeo because your arms are longer than your legs and people just laugh. Oh, it's because I'm Jewish, isn't it? No! <laughs> what about Lear? Damien, you read for Lear. The director thought you were over the top. You portrayed Lear's anguish when he finds Cordelia hanging dead by turning to the audience and sucking your foot. Well, that's how I saw him. Oh, yes. Also in your interpretation, Lear spent the entire second act, Damien, sitting on Edmund's head, trying to pull his ears off. I was good, damn it. Damn good. All right, Damien, Damien, calm down. Have a cup of tea. Why, I hate bloody tea. <laughs> Welcome to Top Secret, and our celebrity panel tonight is Willie Waterwit, Blondie Blankbrain, and Rodney Raconteur. And will you please welcome your host, Mr. Barry Tookhead. Good evening. Before we start, Rodney, can we have one of your marvellous, witty, true stories? Well, it's funny you should say that, because this is absolutely true. Now, this actually happened to me, personally. No, no, not joking. It really happened to me, right? I got up this morning and I came here. <laughs> <laughs> but enough of the funny anecdotes. <laughs> Let's meet our first guest with a secret. Good evening, and who are you? I come from Wales, and my name's Neil Kinnock. <laughs> and now, for the, for the viewers at home and the studio audience, here is Neil Kinnock's secret. <laughs> and here is a clue. Since he started his job, he's disappeared without trace. <laughs> Willie. Uh, you disappeared fairly recently. Uh, yes. Uh, within the last year? Uh, yes. <laughs> I've got it. You're Shergar. <laughs> no, no. I I'm alive. Well, Neil, we've only got your word for that. <laughs> Blondie. Are you in politics, Mr Kinnock? Uh, no. Are you in the Labour Party? Uh, yes. Well, Neil, we've only got your word for that. <laughs> Are you Riley Ace of Spies? No, no, no. Is it a hobby? Uh, well, it is at the moment. Uh, can anybody do it? Uh, anybody but Dennis Healy. Oh. <laughs> so you have to be sober to do what you do, right? Uh, do we see you on television or read about you in the press? Uh, no, not since I became leader of the Labour Party. You gave it away, uh, because, in fact, uh, Neil's secret is he's the leader of the Labour Party. <laughs> yes. And let's have a look at a piece of film of you in action. Uh, in fact, I think it was the last time anybody noticed you. <laughs> of course, you're Glenys' husband. Glenys' <laughs> husband. <laughs> Tomorrow on BBC One, the hunt is on for the killer whale. Listen, you won't catch one, but you might butcher a couple of dozen in the attempt. Ah, oh, that's not my style at all. So you refuse to quit? That's not my style either. 
lots of bad luck. Despite the protests and the dangers, the hunter sets out to capture alive a killer whale. How many cc's it open the harpoons? Well, if the whale is twice the size of the shark, therefore we use twice as much. Nolan. What? You know, killer whales are monogamous. Monogamous? What does that mean? They stick with one mate all their life. Do you realize we could be busting up a happy family? The Sunday thriller, Orca the Killer Whale, tomorrow at 8.40 on BBC One. Well, that looks pretty scary. And from what I gather, the next hour and a half is going to be even more so. With a certain chill in the air, and I sense a shiver down the spine, we invite you to sample some late-night horror in the shuttered room.